Hikaru Nakamura has been accused of cheating. The claim sounds ridiculous, but if you don't know about it, I'll catch you up on the context. Then we'll take a look at two of Hikaru's games where one of them does look particularly suspicious, and we'll get to make a decision of our own. If you don't care about the drama, feel free to skip to the end. You'll learn a thing or two, but yeah, here we have Hikaru. He's not happy on Twitter. Vladimir Kremnik, the previous world champion, is basically <laughs> accusing him of cheating. Uh, you can't read the very bottom, but Vladimir is basically saying that Hikaru played 46 blitz matches and won literally all of them and only drew a, a single one. And then he, he ends it with, I believe everyone would find this interesting. So he's calling out Hikaru. Hikaru is not happy. He's also not happy because Jan is uh, jumping on the bandwagon uh, with his own cheeky tweet. It's hard to know what Jan even means here. Uh, but yeah, it's... Uh, it's funny, man. It, it, it's funny. Uh, the Hans Niemann drama actually got me into chess. So chess drama does have a special place in my heart. But yeah, Kremnik is talking about this massive win streak that Hikaru went on. So we're going to we're gonna take a look, but you can see it's pretty epic. Like, what was it, like 40 games in a row or something? Um, and just that single draw. Uh, but the interesting thing with the, the cheating claim is a, a lot of these games are actually quite low accuracy. So uh, yeah, just just some more context. Again, we're, we're going to decide at the end what we think of this, uh, this whole situation. Uh, but yeah, Kremnik's been on a bit of a crusade trying to call out cheaters. His most interesting resource I found was this one, where basically he's comparing the, the two main columns you look for are fights for prizes and doesn't fight for prizes. He, he's basically saying that titled players on like online tournaments where their prize pools will overperform. So yeah, th this is, I can see why people would be worried about this. And yeah, the stats are a bit suspicious because yeah, from what I've heard, it it's not too difficult for a, a GM to, you know, make like the engine, like one move here or there to just like slightly increase his rating. Uh, the funniest thing about this this graph, though, is that it calls out Ferruja, like, so hard. Ferruja is, like, one of the best, like, bullet players in the world. And when he's playing for prizes, he plays, like, three, like 275 ELO below his average. So Ferruja needs to work on his nerves of steel. But that's roughly the drama. Kremnik's on a crusade, but he calls out Hikaru, which is a big, which is a big claim. I'm not too sure about it, but we'll take a look at some of Hikaru's matches. I've got two here. The first one is a quick win, and I just realized this is spoilers. We'll get to that position. The first one is a quick win, so this is just an awesome trap to remember. His accuracy was like 99.5% in this, but it's only like 11 moves. The second match is interesting. It actually looks like an engine is playing because Hikaru makes some crazy moves, super high accuracy. So stick around for that one, but first, let's take a look at the first match. So in our matches today, Hikaru is up against the IM from the USA Piola. And Hikaru has, if we let this load, a 16-0 record against him. So it's not looking too good for Piola. I had a quick look. He's named after, like, one of the best soccer coaches of all time or something. So the picture on screen is probably not him. I found it in his chess.com bio. But yeah, this is one of the two matches we'll look at today. This is the quick one. He loses in 11 moves. So... It starts out with the ready, so Hikaru's just playing knight f3, but just transposes into pretty much a modern defense, well, exactly a modern defense here. And they're just playing the normal moves. d6 is to stop e5. Hikaru does a bit of a strange move here, actually. So normally you don't bring the bishop out here because it can get kicked around a little bit, and that is actually what is about to happen. He just continues to develop his pieces. Queen moves to x-ray the king. And our opponent plays d5. This is what we were talking about. It hits the bishop with tempo. But Hikaru just drops back. The pawn is taken. Hikaru takes back with the queen. And again, it's a bit of a funky opener because now this queen is going to get chased away. Hikaru retreats. Our opponent castles. Hikaru castles. They bring their knight forward. Hikaru centralizes his rook. I know I'm going over this quickly because the key point is this blunder in the match. It is instantly plus 5 Point two. So pause for a second, have a look at this position, and see if you can find the best move. So the best move is, and I'll give you one more second if you haven't paused yet, it is bishop takes f7. Now this might have been a bit obvious because uh, it was like one of the only tactical things you could do in the position, 
But the reason why is quite interesting. So this is really common in a lot of these King's Indian setups, especially when this knight is blocking the queen. There's an interesting line where, uh, and I think I have a short on this, I'll, I'll link it in the description, where this queen gets completely trapped because it's basically surrounded by all its own pieces. So if they haven't played c6, there's a really interesting line where they take, you jump the knight forward, you bring your knight here, and then this queen is just completely trapped. Not in this line, but this is just why I'm saying this is a great general tactic to remember. In this line, it's a similar setup. You play knight g5. The problem for black is if they move back here, it's actually made in five. And again, it's because this knight is blocking this bishop. This square is now incredibly weak. And I'll show you the checkmate. It's a beautiful smothers mate. You start with a queen e6 check. King can't go this way or else it's mate. So you go there, check. Oh, well, I'll actually show you the moves. Check, king goes back. And then classic kind of like smothers mate tactic. Double check, king goes back. Queen sacrifice, rook has to take. And then it's a smothered mate. So that's one thing to remember in this kind of tactical position. The best move is to just not take the bishop, so just move aside. And when you get the rook, for whatever reason, the engine is like really impressed with white's position here. I think it's just because black's king is so exposed, and obviously you're still up a pawn and in exchange, so you're doing great. And then the final one to remember is when they take, the actual best move here is they just move back to queen F, uh, king f8, and that's where this fork comes in, and you win the queen. So killer tactic, black just resigned immediately. It's a 99.7% accurate game from Akaru. So now we'll jump to the next match. This one's longer, but it's still very high accuracy, and Akaru does play a bit like an engine in it. So in the match, we have a Sicilian defense, e4, c5. Black wants to control that d4 square. And Akaru plays the rarer knight c3 here. You see almost everyone playing knight f3, and then the open Sicilian with d4. But we're going to see, after some normal moves from black, it pretty much transposes into the exact same thing. We get taking in the center, our opponent is developing their knight, still totally normal stuff. The bishop generally belongs here in these setups to support this knight a bit more. And then the strange move, especially if you haven't seen this before, is e5. Now this is really common in a lot of Sicilian structures. Basically, you force the knight back, and the reason it looks so bad is you get this backwards pawn and it feels like it should be easy to pile up the pressure it's like maybe let's put a knight here blockade it get our queen and our rook and maybe our other rook on that file eventually win that pawn and win the game and honestly i think like i like playing against this setup it's quite easy to play against but the idea especially at the highest level is that there's a lot of theory here that basically means that this pawn is actually very safe it's quite hard to really mount a campaign to win it properly like the bishop defends it the queen defends it everything's very compact these knights can like retreat to defend it as well so yeah it looks super strange but it's actually quite normal in these setups our opponent plays h6 here just delaying castling for whatever reason hikaru plays h3 which makes a bit more sense this bishop would love to pin this knight here so the bishop just jumps to this square as well which is definitely the next best square in this structure Hikaru starts a pawn storm, which is uh, maybe getting a bit aggressive, and it allows d5. Now, this is an important to remember when you do have these backward pawns, is that they are weaknesses, and they can be a pain, and it is easy to lose them. So, it is always great if you can find the opportunity to push those pawns, alleviate that weakness, and now black is just absolutely chilling. He even has a slight advantage. So, Hikaru in this spot decides he doesn't like how good this knight is, so he decides to trade it off. And Black responds by taking with the Queen, offering a Queen trade, which Akaru is fine with. It lets him castle Queenside a bit quicker. Our opponent recaptures, hitting the Knight. So the Knight has to be defended. Opponent develops normally. And here comes Hikaru castling Queenside. But this is where it starts to look a bit like an engine. He allows his opponent to take on A2. And this is only justified because of this massive crazy line that Akaru somehow must have calculated or I guess depending on uh, what your opinion is. Because in this spot, it, it's, it's a very common idea, and this is what Akaru plays. He plays b3, because b3, this bishop is now completely trapped, but you don't want to fall for this in your own games. If this bishop can check here, which happens in this match, it can be a bit of a disaster. I've gotten checkmated in this way, so uh, definitely be careful. But in this spot, instead, Hikaru just decides to run his king away it looks very suspicious it looks Hikaru's about to get mated because here comes another check 
with the long castle. But Akaru just calmly moves his king aside. And now, black is actually in a lot of trouble because these bishops are overextended. And the problem is, once the rook gets there, it doesn't only hit the bishop, it actually will x-ray them. And this is what Hikaru completely calculated. So, black just continues to develop normally, but you can see the engine is loving Hikaru's spot because he just swings the rook over. It's attacking both these bishops. Black tries to hold it together by jumping this knight forward, but I, I think the best move would have just been to sack the bishop and call it a day because you can see this knight's very flimsy. It's could just get immediately chased away by c3. It's not looking very solid at all. Hikaru decides, instead of chasing away with the pawn, to pin it with the bishop. So this is now a pin. This bishop is undefended. It looks like the knight could jump here, and that almost works, except the problem is you can take the, uh, you can take the light squared bishop with your rook, which also attacks the knight, which also attacks the bishop, which will also defend and pin that Rook if the, the dark squared bishop is taken. So uh, maybe that's what our opponent had in mind and uh, thought about when he went for this line. But Hikaru just decides you know, to pin and eventually collect his advantage. Now black tries to stay in this game here and keep things very complicated. And they do this by pushing e4. Now this looks very dangerous. It threatens to capture the knight with check, which would just be horrible. But Hikaru can just jump the knight away. It jumps into this rook, which is a bit of a problem, but Hikaru is keeping everything together and still threatening to win these bishops. So black tries to keep things complicated, jumps the knight away, but Hikaru, he doesn't have to take this bishop just yet, otherwise he would lose his own and be worse. First he takes that bishop, and here comes the nice idea from uh, black here. They then jump in with the check. It's a fork on the king and the knight. If the king moves this way, the rook will now come in and be super active. So Hikaru just decides to sacrifice the bishop because he's already up material and he's about to win this bishop back. So the opponent takes the bishop but allows Hikaru to collect their bishop. They try and push a pawn, sacrifice. Oh, sorry, not sacrificing it, but the knight comes back. The king just calmly moves away. He's down a full piece. He's up against Akaru. The time situation is also really bad, so he just decides to resign. So let me know in the comments if you think uh, well, this game or just the Hakaru situation is suspicious. Personally, I don't think it's suspicious at all. But I, I think Kremnik does have a point with uh, like the titled players and with prize money. It's always tough because I had a similar thing with like... Um, like match fixing in esports. There was a big scandal with a StarCraft player where, uh, and CSGO, there's been quite a few um, match throwing scandals. And it's like, you watch these people, you, you think, you know, why would they risk it all? They have a career, like, why would they do these things? But p some people, like, genuinely think they can get away with it. So I, I think, you know, the, the general uh, idea of, like, we have to be careful of people cheating at the highest level makes sense and it obviously sucks to play against cheaters when you're playing but when it comes to Hikaru like Hikaru is balling man like he's like making plenty of money off streaming chess is like this or like competitive chess has become like a side thing for him that he uh has been doing a lot better and he, he proclaims it's because of uh like that stress taken off which you can believe, right? So, like, obviously, we, we can't know anything for sure, but I, I definitely don't think Hikaru could be cheating, but it, it definitely leads to a, a funny, yeah, funny situation. So, thanks for watching. That's it for this video. Uh, let me know in the comments. Again, I'm super curious to hear what you all think, and, uh, yeah, if you think it's a funny situation as well. And, yeah, other than that, thanks for watching. There should be a video above me that YouTube thinks you'll like, so click on that, and I will see you soon.